I am very familiar with the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. My parents wouldn't have named me after him if they weren't willing to share the story with me. A great musician lost his wife to death, so he used his musical talent to travel to the underworld, using his musical challenges to relieve the suffering of the damned, and he impressed both Hades and Persephone enough to convince them to bring back his wife from the dead. Hades agreed. He said that Orpheus could leave the underworld and that Eurydice would follow, but Orpheus would not be allowed to turn around until both him and his wife left the underworld and felt the sunlight of the world above. Orpheus then led his wife out, but he was plagued by thoughts of Hades tricking him. He kept his head held high until he made his way out of the underworld and he turned around, where he saw Eurydice's ghostly image still in the shadow of the underworld. Because he turned around before the two of them finished leaving the underworld, he lost the love of his life forever because he couldn't be patient enough to just wait for a few more seconds to see her. For most of my life, I never understood why he couldn't just wait a few extra seconds. Why was he so impatient to see her again? At least, that was what I wondered until I fell in love with myself. And now I am in a situation not too dissimilar to the mythical Orpheus' situation. I should start at the beginning. I met my, my wife, Agriope, in community college, and we immediately fell in love. It wasn't quite love at first sight, but it was close. The first thing a gripe he noticed about me wasn't the way I looked, it was the way I played music. I was in one of the music rooms playing my guitar as I recorded it, and for whatever reason she was in the recording room delivering a message to the music professor. I wasn't facing the glass, I don't like my own reflection, so all she heard was the way I was playing my guitar. So she waited quietly in the room while I recorded myself playing my guitar, and then I recorded myself singing. We never made eye contact, we never truly saw each other, but she heard my voice and my music and she loved it. When I was done recording and went into the recording room is when we officially met in person. She asked me if I wanted to get a cup of coffee with her, so I agreed. The coffee on campus was expensive, but there was an absolutely gorgeous mural just outside I loved to look at while resting. When we got our lavender lattes, we sat outside to look at the mural, and I told Agriope about how much I loved the mural. I loved the fact that it was an angelic scene that had a dark reflection below. Scenes above became mountains above below. The winged angels became scary demons, and how an act of pleasure above became one of pain below. Such as how smelling a rose above was having a rose grown out of their flesh below. As I told Agriope that I loved the mural, she revealed that she was the one who painted the mural. She had painted several throughout the campus, all of which were some of my favorites and usually had to deal with themes of dealing with both the light and the dark side of the world together. And we hit it off. Before the end of the year, we had decided to move in together, and by the time we graduated, we had wedding plans. We both were successful artists. She had massive commissions that made her money, and I had revenue from selling songs to musicians who wanted to make it their own. It wasn't the most exciting life, but it was one that we loved. We had our own home, we had our own studios where we could practice our own art and our own work. A place where we were successful artists and we were in love. I was like walking on clouds, except all too quickly, Agriope got sick. I wasn't there when she got sick but she got sick too quickly and died before I had a chance to see her. The coroner said the disease wasn't caught in enough time to be treated, but to be glad that she went quickly, and many others around her suffered for hours. Still, it hurt. Such a large part of my heart was just gone. Life moved on, but it didn't feel like life anymore. The sunlight felt cold, Food was bland, 
blankets no longer felt right and all joy was gone. Even looking at her old art didn't bring me as much joy as it used to. It only reminded me that Agriope was gone. I found myself explaining things in my day like I was going to tell Agriope, only to remind myself that I would never be able to tell her anything anymore. I would explain why I would use certain chords and notes for a song to create a certain emotion, and I would remember she wasn't going to hear it. I would talk about what to get for dinner, and then I would stop. There was no longer a point in explaining why I got certain foods, but not others. In millions of little ways, my life was lonely without her. Even tasks I did alone felt lonelier because I knew when I was done, I would never see her again. When I was low, I did something I used to make fun of others for. I tried to find meaning in the world beyond the veil. When Agriope was alive, I didn't understand why people would try and find out about the world beyond our own. The physical world felt like it was enough. It was complicated enough without fey and esoteric energy. When Agriope was gone, I wanted some kind of answer, some sort of comfort that Agriope was all right. Something to comfort me. At least at first it started as a source of comfort, but inevitably I started to see tales about people who tried to undo death. Most of them were horror stories about people brought back wrong, or about why someone you bring back may not be who you intended to obtain. And then there were a few, so very few stories of those who came so close but failed that last step. Tales like my namesake, or about rituals that can bring back the dead, but you would have to run from death for the rest of your life. Finally, deep in a book about modern veil law, I found something I could use. Apparently, there was an entire branch of legal theory just about dealing with deities and high concepts like life and death. It pointed towards the fact that judgment, like court rulings, could be appealed. If it was appealed after a certain amount of time and before a year had passed. It referred to other documents that I also eagerly consumed in my search on how to bring back my sweet Agriope. Apparently, I was still in the grace period, where I could appeal the judgments and even death but I would have to seek out the mausoleum, which was somehow in a place further west than the sun could set. Considering the fact I am pretty sure that I couldn't just take the bus to the mausoleum, then I had to speed run through books on how to open paths to the mausoleum, and I had to learn what the paths were, and I had to learn how to find them, and then I had so much to learn about beings that walked the paths all of which had to be sped read and understood quickly. The appeal process was only a year, and I had to appeal quickly, so I had essentially a children's level of understanding of everything, but it was all I could learn before I ran out. So on the night of the full moon, less than 24 hours from the anniversary of her death, there I was at a crossroads, trying to get a Doncy's notice. The books on the paths had a few different examples of how to open paths, but the only one I could use easily was contacting a Doncy. Apparently, I could get her attention by offering her a tea cake on a crossroads, and she might bring me to the mausoleum. The key word was might. Adonce was known as the Marquess of Madness for a reason. Even though she had saved many lives, she also was smart enough that she could punish those who tried to exploit her. Although she was my only hope, I couldn't offer an iron key at the cost of my soul, 
I couldn't summon a demon, and I was definitely not going to be walking backwards into the sunset until it became a sunrise. So there I was, late at night, offering a tea cake. Hello there, can I have the cake? A young child said from the darkness. I was about to refuse until I saw the child. I saw that she had a large hat with lots of ribbons, including purple, and the way she moved was not like anyone else I had seen. Every step was like a dance to a beat that only she could hear. Her eyes glanced everywhere and seemed to see everything, watching the birds, watching the bugs, and even the way the dying light glinted off the asphalt. And yet, at the same time, her focus was always on me. I didn't get a feeling that she was distracted. I felt that she just was always there. I just noticed her. Yeah, sure, welcome to my crossroads, I told Adonsi, as she eagerly snacked up the pink tea cake and she looked around the roads. Crossroads? Hardly. A true crossroad has four paths. Five if you're clever. You're at a T-junction, she said, pointing around, and I realized she was right. The road was a T-junction. I'm sorry, I always mix them up, but can I still have your help? I asked Adonsi. Why? I already told you what a crossroads is. Isn't that helpful? Adonsi giggled as I spoke. I need help getting to the mausoleum. Help in what way? I cannot go to the mausoleum. Why can't you go to the mausoleum? I thought you wanted to go there. I do want to go there, but I cannot get there without your help. I don't think you answered my question. What kind of help do you need? Adonzi asked, and I felt like it was a challenge or at least a test, so I tried a different way. I made the effort to go to the crossroads. I got you a tea cake. The deal was that if I got you a tea cake, you would be able to help me open the path to the mausoleum, so that way I can go there and appeal my wife's judgment. So, honor your deal. I said, and the air felt frozen. Adonce froze where she was, the cake half-eaten and halfway brought to her face. Her eyes turned ancient and angry. I didn't know that eyes could carry so much anger in them. I made no such deal. I found you on a tea junction, and I asked you for your cake, and you agreed to let me have it. You didn't negotiate before you gave. You didn't offer the cake as an opening tribute with an additional cake ready to offer in further negotiation. You asked me for help, and when I asked how I could help, you weren't clear. You demanded that I help you. You didn't ask, you demanded. I do not serve you, and I do not put up with being spoken to in such a way. I can plunge your mind into badness where you are barely able to understand how to maintain yourself, or I can make it where you are unable to process how to be a person, or I can just leave you here at the T-junction and let you suffer with your feelings. However, that isn't who I am, that isn't what I am, and most importantly, that is not the story I want you to tell. So, let's try this again. She said, with power flowing in her words before her eyes calmed, and her words no longer held power and anger. How can I help you? She asked, and I finally answered. I don't know how to get to the mausoleum. Can you please bring me to the mausoleum so I can make an appeal for my wife? And then can you bring us back to this tea junction? I asked Adonsi as she tapped her chin before she nodded. I can do it, but I will accompany you 
but the task you face will be your own, and I will not speak on your behalf. When you stand before the judges, you will stand alone, or you will fall alone, Adonzi said before I nodded, and she pointed towards a black van that had tinted windows. That is our ride. Come on, I have shotgun, she said as I pulled open the door, and I sat inside. The leather seats were soft and comfortable. I still couldn't see the driver, but Adonce sat in the passenger seat as we drove through the night. The sun finally finished setting. Why did you help me? I asked Adonce. She turned and she thought about whether or not it was worth answering. She clearly had that question asked a lot, and sometimes it was people who were serious, and sometimes people who weren't serious. And every time she had to consider if it was worth the effort to even answer. Once upon a time, there was a little girl. She had a dream that if she had great powers, she would make things fair for everyone. In a time of great suffering, ash, death, and despair, she kept her hope. She shared what little food she had with both rabbits and fellow people. She found a rabbit hole that led to a world full of food, warmth, and safety. So, she didn't keep it to herself. She went back and brought everyone she could. No matter how many times people told her to stop helping others, no matter how many warnings were given to her, no matter how many people told her to stop, no matter how many times she died, she kept saving others. She kept bringing others to her new home, and she kept finding more little girls who just wanted one chance to make things fair. Sometimes those little girls weren't little. Sometimes they weren't girls. But they all reminded that little girl of who she was and what she wanted to do when she had just one chance. So, she wanted to give so many other little girls that one chance. She said, as I thought about it before I asked. So, I remind you of yourself, I asked, and she shrugged. In a way, yes. You want one chance to make everything right, and I can give you that chance? So, I will. I've seen this story so many times, and... How many times, Orpheus, will the same story be told before people learn their lesson? She asked me before I realized. I never told you my name, and I'm not the Orpheus from the old story you're thinking about. I told her, and she giggled. I know you're not the Orpheus from the story, but you never introduced yourself, and you never asked me for my name. You made an assumption. So, don't make assumptions and don't think that others can fill in the details that you are skipping over. Sometimes what they fill in isn't something that will help you. And when you are making your case, you cannot assume they will fill in the blanks. They may just decide to turn it on you and add rules that they just assume you understand. And to answer the other part of your question, I know you're not the first to try to bring back others from the dead, and you won't be the last. Some will succeed, most will fail, and I have watched the story happen so many times. My question isn't when will you learn about Orpheus, since clearly you knew about these stories. The question is when will people understand the importance of not trying to trick the gods? You forgot to introduce yourself and ask who I am. Do you really think you can fool both Hades and Persephone? Bouncy asked me as we continued to be driven to the mausoleum. I'm not going to fool them. I'm not going to trick them. And if you think my story will just end the same as all the others, then why are you helping me? I asked the Marquess of Madness, who responded with a single sentence. You wanted a chance to prove me wrong. 
you know how the story is supposed to end. So change it, Adansi said as we finally stopped, which was strange because as far as I could feel, there were no turns, no stops, just a smooth sensation forward. But it was now my stop, so I left the vehicle and the door shut and locked behind me. Adansi was still inside and I was on the edge of a river. The river was dark with no way back as far as I could see. Just a dock in front of me with a gondola and a hooded figure with a long pole and a lantern. In the far distance, I could see an island on the river, and beyond that island, I can see the start of the sunless lands on the far side of the river. The far side of the river was full of massive trees that towered over even skyscrapers. The bark and branches were stone-like, and it blocked out the rest of the sunless lands. But as tempting as it was to try and explore the sunless lands, that wasn't my goal. My goal was the mausoleum on the island, the last stop between life and death. The building resembled a courthouse more than it did a final resting place. Large white columns surrounded all sides. The large steepled roof with gold plating and the steps leading up to it were carved in black granite. Intimidating, even by the scale of most courthouses, although it was hard to gauge the size, it was definitely larger than the courthouse in Imperial City, but the distance from the shore was hard to gauge. All I had was the gondola with a cloaked figure on the front of the boat. There was a lantern hanging from the prow, and the figure's face was hidden so I couldn't see their face. Their hands were covered in a metal gauntlet that gripped the pole. At the edge of the dock, I tried to look the gondolier in the face, and I tried not to look into the water below as I spoke to the ferryman. Even with the boat over a meter below me, I still had to look up beneath the ferryman's hood unable to see anything but darkness where the face should be. Can you bring me to the mausoleum? I asked the ferryman, who nodded, and held out their hand, asking for a coin to cross over. This one I was familiar with. I pulled out a single copper centi and placed it on the gauntlet as the ferryman slid it into their pockets, and I finally stepped onto the boat. The boat looked like it should be rickety as the ferryman finally pushed away from the dock and slowly pushed us towards the mausoleum. As we made our way across, I wondered about the river below, and I looked below. Despite our movement, the water was still and ripple-free. There was no sound and no smell. The only way I knew the water was there was because I saw that there were things swimming beneath the water. Bony things that weren't quite fish, and I hope weren't quite human. And despite how calm and quiet the surface of the water was, the movement underneath the water was like a flood. Sea creatures, animals, plants, even a few things that were monstrous in appearance, all flowed beneath the water. The death of non-sentient beings led to all of the bodies beneath the water. Bodies I did not recognize, beings that didn't possess enough intelligence to be judged. So they moved forward into the sunless lands, free of judgment beneath the sticks. It was overwhelming to look into. Looking at all of the death beneath you, mere centimeters away. The sticks would have to be hundreds or even thousands of kilometers deep to hold so many bodies, 
And here I was on a flimsy wooden boat, trying to argue why one soul didn't need to die. I looked away from the water below, and I looked above, thinking maybe the astronomy of the sunless lands was easier to understand than its oceanography. If what I saw below the boat was chilling, then what I saw above was haunting. I saw that Seoul was setting to the east, and I could also see two different skies above. I could see familiar constellations, nebulas, and galaxies dancing above me in ways I never would have seen back in the land of the living. And the sunless sky I saw was far darker than the sky I was familiar with. The sunless sky was dark. It pulsed, it thrummed, it sung, it howled, it swirled. It was so dark, but it wasn't entirely devoid of light. There were a few stars, so few and far between. Distant notes of warmth in such a cold symphony. There were a few planets, comets, and moons. So far from the world, but it was clear that the sunless lands weren't just death for the animals and people. Even the death of celestial objects like stars and comets came to the sunless lands, and that might be why the sunless lands were called that. Soul still lived, the earth's sun still breathed, still grew, and still warmed the exoteric world. The sun would need to die before it could go to the sunless lands taking humanity and Earth with it to the sunless lands. And when that happens, would there be any functional difference between the land of the living and the land of the dead? All of the living would then be in the land of the dead, and only the dead would remain in the land of the living. And then I had a horrifying realization. My universe was a hot place that was growing colder. Slowly, but it was. Eventually, all of the heat will go away, and every last bit of energy, matter, and information would pass on to the sunless lands. Cold place that was growing warmer with every death. They live because we die. And it isn't even accurate to think about the situation as an us and them situation. I live in the living world, but in time I will pass on into the sunless lands. So I was just a part of the flow of energy from one universe to another. But then did the energy from my universe come from somewhere else? Did the energy in the sunless lands flow somewhere else? Would we keep following it, creating and destroying new universes for eternity? It was like reincarnation, but on a universal scale. Would this be something we could ever prove or disprove? Would it be something I wanted an answer for? I was chilled by my thoughts when we arrived at the mausoleum. It took me a few seconds before I could focus enough to walk up the steps. Thoughts plaguing me were still swirling some, but I quietly fouled it away, thinking it might make a decent song when I leave the sunless lands. This wasn't my first existential threat. And being an artist, I was used to putting existential thoughts and big emotions into my art. On the steps of the mausoleum, I saw many others in suits and formal outfits from every era, including as far back as the Paleo Age. They spoke quietly in languages I couldn't quite understand. Languages that felt like it was something I should know, but I was never formally taught. 
Still, I pushed myself forward into the lobby when I realized I wasn't the only person there. Or should I say the only living person there? It wasn't obvious at first who was or wasn't alive. There were a few hints that some of the guests were more than meets the eye. A feather out of place here, tattoos that glowed silver, eyes that glowed red, and a single clawed finger. But everyone was hard to focus on. If I tried to focus too long on any one person, they grew more out of focus or they would simply vanish. I didn't know where to go and I had no idea who was or wasn't alive until I saw something on the floor. My shadow. I still cast a shadow even in the mausoleum. Most of the figures here didn't. No shadows around them at all. I remembered an old legend that demons wouldn't cast shadows and neither would ghosts. And that was why you had to check before you made deals with them. So now I was looking to see if anyone else had a shadow. Maybe I could ask them where I would go since I had no idea which unmarked door led to where I wanted to go. Fortunately, I did see one person with a shadow. A young man, barely a college student, with long brown hair and his suit was navy blue with a symbol of Themis on his left breast pocket. He was chatting with a young boy with similar brown hair but no shadow. Maybe his dead son or dead brother? A little sad, but I still approached the young man and I asked, Sorry to bother you, but I am trying to appeal a death and I don't know where to go. I asked the man who turned to me and he was smiling. The first human smile I had seen in so many weeks. Yeah, I'm headed over there right now. I'll bring you with me. I'm Kel, by the way. What's your name? He asked and I responded. I'm Orpheus. I'm appealing for my wife, I said as he nodded, and he told me about the mausoleum. I am sure that there were interesting facts about the mausoleum, but the only thing I cared about was the paintings that I saw on the walls leading up to the courtroom. They were my wives. Beautiful paintings of both the sunless and soulful lands, side by side. Each more beautiful and far deeper than all of my wife's paintings when she lived. And here she was. Even after death, she was still making art. Art that no living person would ever see. Except me and this weirdly happy guy. I don't get how he could be so happy when his dead son was walking alongside him. He had a reminder of death right next to him, and I was reminded of death on the walls leading up to the courtroom. And yet, Kel kept smiling at the reminder of those who lived. I was only reminded of those that had died. The courtroom was nothing like how I expected. There were two different thrones on the far end. A pale man in black and silver sat on the throne on my left. His hair resembled a black helm with streaks of silver adding authority to him. His eyes were tired and powerful. The eyes of someone who was being graceful by letting you speak but who would just as easily punish a waste of time. A reminder that my time would need to be invested carefully. His face was full of lines from a, num from a lifetime of frowning, with only a few smile lines around his eyes. If I was to guess, he was Hades. 
His wife sat next to him since it was winter. She was either spending the cold months with Hades, either time she was tricked into it, or time she was desperate to have to be with her husband. Depending on what stories you listen to. She was dressed in green and gold, her suit the same cut as her husband's. Where her husband's hair was dark with silver throughout, her hair was golden with flowers braided within, possibly growing flowers from her head or braided in herself. I was nearly certain she was Persephone. There was a place for me to sit, but even with all of us sitting, the two gods sat above me. Kel handed me the folder as he whispered. Any document you need is here. Argue honestly, but passionately, Kel recommended as he vanished into the darkness with the dead boy. I sat before the gods. Both there was only the darkness, the table in front of me, a light above, and the gods before me. I waited for them to speak, but when they didn't, I decided to speak first. Hello, I am Orpheus, and you both are, I asked, trying to remember Adonsi's words about not making assumptions and forgetting to introduce myself. I am Hades, firstborn of Cronus, king of the Argivian underworld, husband to Persephone. I figured you already knew that, he, did, he said, speaking from the shadows with a voice that would have shook the earth. I was once Korra, I am now Persephone, daughter of Demeter. Princess of Argivian Springtime, Queen of the Argivian Underworld, Wife to Hades. Persephone spoke with a voice that drifted through the chamber of darkness like a warm breeze that snuck into a cold room. She was resting her head on her hand, already bored with me. I hadn't even made my opening argument, and I am boring the gods I had to make my case to. But they weren't acting like Adonse at all, so now I would have to start immediately making my case to them. As you know, I am trying to get my wife back. I love her terribly, and I miss her more and more every day. It's been almost a year since her death, and it hasn't gotten any easier. Everything reminds me of her, where she was on the bed, the studio I haven't touched since her death, even something as simple as the way the light glints off the grass when I'm walking outside. There's so many things I want to tell her and so many conversations I want to have. It isn't just the big moments like anniversaries and birthdays I have missed, but all the little moments you don't even know you're missing them until you're gone. I miss the messes she made from painting. I miss the way after a long day of painting, she would be too hungry and tired to eat, so I would have to cook for her. I even miss all the late nights where we stayed up just chatting about her newest project. And I miss all of those moments, both the good and the bad. I said as Hades leaned forward, his face inscrutable, but the very fact he's inscrutable rather than bored gives me hope. Persephone is paying attention as well, her head no longer resting on her hand. What bad moments, Hades asked, and I realized I would have to talk about the bad times along with the good times as well. Sometimes we would both get so wrapped up into our projects, we would forget to spend time together. Sometimes I would write and record for days, not realizing I haven't seen her in days as well. So then I finally remembered to check on her. She didn't realize I was gone too. 
the both of us are both wrapped up in our work so much that we forgot that there was a world outside of the art. And sometimes only one of us got wrapped up in our art while the other wasn't. I could feel a lot of guilt with what I was about to say, but I knew I had to be honest. If Hades knew I was lying, how would he react? More than once, I would be gone for a long time, gone for days at a time for my work, and I couldn't spend time with Agriope doing that. I always promised her that I would take her along one of those times, but it always felt easier to leave her behind so I could focus on work. By the time she got sick, I didn't know for three days because I wasn't checking her texts nor calls at the time. When I learned what happened, I came home as soon as I could, but she had already passed by then. I wasn't able to say goodbye because I was so wrapped up in my art that I forgot that she was there and I didn't pay attention. I want to make it right again, I admit to Hades, who leaned back in his throne, his fingers steepled. So you want to make it right. So why should I help you? He asked me, and I realized what Adonsi was saying in the car. That was the connection to both Hades and Adonsi. They weren't the same type of people. However, they both have seen the same kind of story play over and over again. And every time, they wanted the story to play out differently. Because once upon a time, there was a little girl who just wanted a chance to save everyone. She was given that chance, and she succeeded. I am also asking for the same chance to save someone, to be given a chance to succeed. This will also be your chance to save someone as well. How often are you asked to save someone? I asked Hades, who only chuckled at my last question. Okay, bad question. What makes you think you will succeed this time? Hades asked, but I could tell I'd nearly had him. Persephone was also intrigued, but she had not addressed me nor asked any questions yet, beyond saying her name. I have traveled further west than the sun can set. I spent the last year trying to find a way to bring her back. This isn't an idle thought nor an accident. I sought you out, and I found you. If I have gone to these lengths just to get her back, what kind of lengths do you think I will go to stay with her? I asked as Hades chuckled at my last words. I finally had his interest. You have convinced me. However, you will still need to convince my wife, Hades said as he nodded towards Persephone. Now I had her focus, I could see she was a bit interested. But unlike her husband, she wasn't interested in being given a chance. She ate the food of the underworld, and now she was cursed to spend time in the underworld, splitting her time between her husband and time with her mother. In most stories, she was taken away from her mother by Hades, kidnapped and imprisoned by a man who claimed to love her, so the world above would only know springtime when she was away from Hades. There were a few stories where she did love Hades too. However, I don't know who I am trying to appeal to. The maiden who lost her name and life because she ate a cursed fruit? Or the young woman who wanted to get away from her mother so badly she would rather be in the underworld than be around her? But I remembered how she introduced herself. She was both the daughter of Demeter and the husband of Hades, princess of springtime and queen of the underworld. Titles are only given if you have pride in the title that you gave. If she was proud of being both the goddess of springtime and of the underworld, then I would have to appeal to both aspects to her, to appeal to both the light and the darkness. 
However, she also told me that she was once Cora. Her name before she married Hades, and her father changed it to Persephone. So I would have to be careful not to seem possessive of Agriope, to avoid reminding her of the worst men she had dealt with in her life. Lady of Springtime, Queen of the Underworld, have you ever loved someone so much that you cannot spend time without them? Still, you are forced to spend time away from them by forces beyond your power. You are separated from them, and even if you can be with them, you still feel the heartache from missing them. And you feel like you can never have that part of you back again? No matter how much you wait, how well you cope, how well you heal, the pain and the ache is still there. Do you know that kind of pain, Cora? I asked her, and I could see a single tear slowly fall from her eye. Regardless of whatever tale is true, or even if none of them are true, Persephone was someone from a divided house separated from her husband, her mother, her father, her past, her present, and future, never able to have all of them at the same time. Where she has to hide me being the queen of the dead when around her mother, where she has to hide being springtime around her husband, where she has to hide her pain from her perfect father, all of whom were people she loved deeply, but were also the people who hurt her so deeply. She knew exactly the kind of pain I was talking about. Pain of never being all of yourself at all times, only ever showing a part at a time and only revealing certain aspects to certain people. A life that you can never tell the whole truth so you're constantly living a lie. A life that my wife had struggled with before she found her art. Persephone was the queen of the dead and the queen of new life, the daughter of Zeus and the wife of Hades. She was the young maiden and the giver of punishments. She was a woman who had many loves and many different parts of her heart, that she couldn't bring together at the same time. I am familiar with this pain. It is a pain my love explores in her art, a feeling she has explored and explained so many times, and one that she clearly has brought to the sunless lands with her. Persephone nodded, still tearing up, and Hades spoke again. You may bring Agriope back from the sunless lands with you to the soulful lands. However, it will take time for her to fully return to a living state. Not all of her is in one place, and it will take time for her to return. So until the fall of the next full moon, in 28 days, you will not look at her as she reforms. She will follow you like a shadow while she reforms forms. Do not look at her while she forms. Do not look at her in the mirror. Don't try to get clever with phones or cameras either. If she is viewed before she returns in full, she will remain how she is, unfinished and neither dead nor alive. And that is not a state that you nor her will enjoy. Also, be wary. If she isn't allowed to return in full, something else may take what she leaves behind and may find a way to the land of the living, like following breadcrumbs. So remember to not look upon her until the next full moon is fully below the horizon. Now go, and she shall follow. Katie said as he pointed back the way I came. I bowed my head in thanks, and in curiosity I opened the folder given to me by Kel. It was empty. I should have known, or at least I should have checked. 
I closed my eyes and I turned away, making my way down the hallway. And when I was certain it was safe, I opened my eyes and I made my way out of the mausoleum. The halls of marble and granite only had the sound of my footsteps and no one else. The lobby was still full of figures with no shadows, all of whom I couldn't see directly, but I was certain they were all staring at me. I kept walking to the steps to make my way to the ferryman. I didn't feel like I had anyone following me. It was quiet behind me, and I didn't feel anyone watching my back. I wanted to check behind me, but I was familiar with the story of my namesake. I had to keep looking forward, and I could not turn around, especially not when it was just beginning. When I made my way to the ferryman, they held up two fingers at me. At first, I thought it was Imperial Sign Language for V, and then I realized that it was for them asking for two copper coins. I eagerly paid the centi, and I sat on the seat closest to the ferryman to give space for a gryope behind me. The ride from the mausoleum to the soulful lands was strange. Clouds that drifted from the world of the living into the land of the dead obscured the dying stars and the planets above, and the fog from the land of the dead hid the water below us. So all I could see was the ferryman and the fog. I couldn't feel movement, and I couldn't be certain that it wasn't a trick. What if it was a trick? What if Hades or Persephone sent me back with no one? Or maybe the ferryman was in on it, and they were bringing me to the Sunless Lands so I could be stuck there forever. That would fulfill my goal of wanting to be with Agriope even if she was on the boat. Full of anxious thoughts, I took a deep breath and I closed my eyes. As I sung a song to myself, a song I haven't sung since the day Agriope died. I still remember that day. I sold a love song to Without Skeletons and I finally checked my phone for a text from Agriope. She was on a cruise ship from Albion to Isle City, a trip she was looking forward to all year, but I couldn't go because I needed to close the sail. But when I checked the text, she mentioned that there was an outbreak on the ship, the Nagafari. She asked me to call for help. She mentioned that there was a quarantine. Then a few hours later, she tried to call, and when she couldn't reach me, she sent out a text saying it wasn't a normal quarantine. She texted something about SAMD syndrome and a message that she was bitten. Then she mentioned that she was ill, and then there was one final phone call attempt. The message left had some growls and quiet sobs. The last message she sent me as she got sick and she died. While she wasn't the only one to die on the Nagafari, most of the passengers had some kind of closure, and I'm sure they weren't ignored by their loved ones. That day, I never hummed nor listened to that song again, even when it came on the radio, and yet here I was humming it to myself while we were riding back to the land of the living. I can see the dock now. The fog faded, and just beyond the dock was the T-junction, where I summoned a Dancy. It felt like it was so long ago, though now, even though it shouldn't have been more than a few hours ago. I thanked the ferryman, and I stepped onto the dock, and I made my way to the T-junction. I wanted to turn around to see how the docks and the sunless lands vanished, but I avoided the temptation, and I made my way back home. 
The sun was starting to rise, the moon still hovered in the sky, and I made it home. I opened the door, and I stepped aside with my eyes closed, hoping to give Agriope a chance to enter the house. I felt nothing, not even a cool breeze, as I gave her that chance. After nearly a minute, I decided that was enough time, and I closed the door. I still closed, I walked my way to the hall closet to grab a blanket, and as I made my way to my bedroom, eyes closed the entire time. I was used to navigating my house with no lights on at all, so I didn't hit anything as I draped the blanket over the mirror in my room. Then I grabbed some masking tape and a tarp before I taped over the mirror in the bathroom. Now there was nowhere I could accidentally view her in the reflection. I called out that I was going to take a shower and then head to bed. I wanted Agriope to know where I was going to avoid being seen. I showered and then I walked to bed, eyes closed, as I pulled up my blankets and wrapped my head in the blanket. A habit I picked up when I was young and I saw a scary movie. It was warm and comforting and it would protect my eyes from any accidental viewings of Agriope. As I drifted off to sleep, and in the in-between space between waking and dreaming, I thought I could feel Agriope's hand on my cheek and her kiss on my forehead. Although there was no way for me to know if it was her or not, she was in my dreams so often. The next day, I woke up, and I tried to adjust to my new routine. This time, I could feel something behind me. It was like being watched, but it also felt cold. So at least now, I knew where she was in comparison to me. Still, I would announce when I was going to turn around or head into a new room to give her a chance to head somewhere else, and strange things began to happen. Things would move around my house, food and drinks would begin to disappear from the fridge, and I noticed the door to Agriope's studio was open. And as curious as I was, I didn't dare open the door to the studio. If Agriope was in there, I couldn't see her. And as time went on, the activity got stranger and stronger. I would wake up, and there would be a full cold breakfast on the dining table. The other plate had a few crumbs on it, but was otherwise free of food. Agriope loved cooking and baking, and she would love seeing me smile for a minute. But she also hated dishes with a passion. Apparently, that continued after death, too. I would also find little notes written around the apartments, usually on adhesive notes or a blank piece of paper. I love you. Take care of yourself. You're out of paint. And most ominous of all, I'm still cold. The words felt like something a Agriope would write, but the handwriting was not what I remembered. And then there were things that would happen that felt creepy. Like when I was just nodding off on the old leather chair, and a blanket was dropped on my head, and I nearly screamed from that unexpected act. Or how I was cleaning the house, and then the radio was turned on to our song. I could hear movement in the living room while I was rooms away, and I wanted to run over and check. However, I couldn't look at a Agriope, or else I would lose her forever. If that was actually a Agriope. Two weeks into our ordeal, I ordered some cheddar sticks and flatbread, and when I answered the door, the delivery guy stared at something behind me as his eyes got wide, and he just stood there, nearly catatonic until I closed the door and he ran back to his car. 
On the 21st day, I could hear voices in my home. Sometimes they sounded like a gryope. She sounded distant, like she was calling for me on the bottom of a well. However, she wouldn't sound quite right, like something trying to speak with her voice, only it didn't sound quite right. Maybe she was learning to speak again, since it had been over a year by this point. Or maybe something else was trying to speak with her voice. In my dark moments, I admit I looked up possible ghosts or demons that could have followed me from Hades' realm. The stories were terrifying, telling me about all these nasty entities that would try to convince me that they were actually my wife before killing me or stealing my soul, and I would have no way to verify any of it without actually looking at her. And if Hades wasn't tricking me, then confirming she was a Gryope would only curse us both. However, if instead I trusted that Hades was honest, then I might just be inviting whatever this is into my life. And most evil entities are at their strongest during the full moon. And I wouldn't put it past Hades to trick me this way. On the 22nd night, I could feel pressure on the bed lying next to me. A cold body that felt familiar in shape, but also felt so disturbingly strange. I could feel her as a physical presence now. Her body shape was well known to me, and even with my eyes closed, her touch felt familiar and in intent, but it was so cold. Cold touch can make you shiver, especially if you're not sure if it is your lover's touch or if it is an imposter. However, on the 28th day, the day of the full moon, I had my answer. By that point, I decided to trust over mistrusting. I had decided either she was my wife or I would die and join her soon. Which wasn't the happiest thought process, but when the cold presence was in the bathroom showering, which it started doing over the last few nights, I made my way to a Gryope studio. I saw that she had a new canvas on her easel, and I could see that she started a new project. A painting of the mausoleum, and I could see both the sunless and soulful lens in the background, both bleeding and overlapping with each other. She had made something that only my wife could have made. No monster could have faked her soul so well to make her art. Now confident in who she was, I often reminded her, her that I loved her and that I looked forward to seeing her just the next day. That night, I held her in my arms with my eyes closed, and I just enjoyed the way she felt in my arms. She started cold, but she warmed up, and she smelled like granite and paint at first. But as the night went on, she started to smell like herself. I could feel her heartbeat for the first time and I could hear her take breaths while we rested together. I slept well that night, and I think it was the first time she slept since she had died. The next morning, with sunlight streaming into the bedroom, I turned to my beautiful Agriope, and I opened my eyes. She had frizzy brown hair and a bad bed head. Her shining brown eyes were closed, but the way her large nose flared while she slept was so familiar. She wore her old bathing suit, which she wore on that fateful day over a year ago. It was torn, bloody, and filthy, but I didn't care about her outfit. I only cared about the woman who wore it. 
I gently cupped her face and she cracked open her eyes and she smiled at seeing my face. She opened her mouth to speak and nothing came out. I could tell she was distressed and I wanted to help her. After a few more breathy sighs, she gave up trying to speak before she switched to Imperial Sign Language. I wasn't as good at it as she was, but I could read what she was spelling. She signed. What happened to my voice? Did you peak early? I told her there was no way I could. It was daylight outside, and there was no full moon outside. I opened the blinds to show both of us, and my heart sank when I saw it. There was still a moon outside, even during the daytime. I looked it up later, but apparently depending on where you live, a moon set can occur well afternoon, which it was supposed to do this day. So even though it was the 29th day, the fact I didn't wait for the moon to set meant that Agriope didn't come back completely. Still, I embraced my wife, and I told her even if she lost her voice, I was glad to have her back. Although I thought it was her talking to me for the last few weeks, after my embrace, she signed to me, I never had a voice over the last few weeks. She signed, and I heard something slam the front door open. I grabbed the bat, and he followed with her cane as we saw the damage done to the front door. Whatever it was, it was big, and it clawed the top of the, fr of the door frame, and the scratches were nearly three centimeters deep as I saw a trail of footsteps leading into the woods. Footsteps that were over three meters long and had three sharp toes that were deep in the mud. Sometimes after that night, I think I can still hear Agriope's voice outside in the woods, calling me out there, saying that she was waiting for me out there. I knew it wasn't her, but it was still eerie, and it was only the start of our challenges. Agriope was dead for over a year. We still, we had to have long talks about who we did or didn't tell about the fact she was back to life. She was okay severing her professional life to build a new one with what she knew now, but we had to tell her mother. Even with pictures, she didn't believe her baby girl returned, not until she came to see for herself. The tears and emotions that night were even more overwhelming than dealing with the Imperial Revenue Service and the government. There was a lot of paperwork about coming back from the dead, and apparently Agriope would owe that year of taxes for that time she was dead. Apparently, the Emperor only cared about miracles as far as they would fill the coffers. I wish I saw that part of the legal books beforehand, but I digress. Still, even with all of the adjustments, I was just happy to see Agriope, and she was happy to be alive again. Even if it cost her her voice, I was happy that was apparently the only part of her that didn't return. Although, sometimes I would find Agriope just crying at night. She would never tell me why, and when I asked her, she didn't realize that she was crying. I would also see her art deal with the darkness in a way she never did before. I used to see her use darkness and light like two halves of the same coin. Her new projects show the darkness as something that was a part of the light, which seems like a small difference. But when your wife's muse changes, you notice. 
And when I tried talking to her about what happened after death, she would freeze. Her breathing got ragged and she started crying. Although her ability to speak was gone, her voice would return to let her cry and wail. It became a large trauma that we would just never address directly. Sometimes she would thank me for what I did, and she would mention something briefly as the time she was gone. She would even admit the fact that she did die, but she would not tell me what happened while she was gone. But she did paint. She painted a broken bridge that was covered in suffering humans that were chained and weighed down. They looked like maggots on a rotting corpse, and so many of them fell or were close to falling. She labeled the painting the Bridge of Trials, and she also painted an endless field of wheat and grass, a field that was filled with countless ghostly shades, and still the fields were farther than the endless ghosts. The sky only had a few dim stars, and most strangely of all, a full moon that shone over the field and the shades that were touched by the moon's light were fully formed and happy. I don't know how they tie to her experience in the salt, sunless lands, but I am certain that they do. And even with our life being an adjustment, I was happy to have her back. Although I now knew that just because not all of Agrippi returned to her, that didn't mean it didn't go somewhere. So to anyone who wants to learn from my lessons, pay close attention to the contract so you don't make a simple mistake. However, that doesn't mean that Agriope and I aren't happy. We have each other, and I am getting really good at signing and we are both learning how to live and love with each other again.